ServiceNow Knowledge 14 is sponsored by ServiceNow. Here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Frick. Here we go. Hi, everybody. We're back. This is Dave Vellante with Jeff Frick. This is theCUBE. We go out to the events. We extract the signal from the noise. We have a crowd chat going on. It's crowdchat.net slash no14. So check that out. Put your tweets in. Crowd chat. Awesome engagement app. Frank Slootman is here. Uh, uh, President and CEO of ServiceNow. Frank, it's, it's a pleasure to have you back on theCUBE. Great to see you again. Great to be here. Thanks, Dave. So how are you feeling? I'm feeling great now that I got the keynote out of the way. You got the keynote out this morning. You had the financial analyst in yesterday. You had the industry analyst, yeah. and uh, they're working you hard. Absolutely, it's a circus. Yeah, yeah so uh, your keynote this morning was great. I was right up front. They have a nice spot for the industry analyst, so I appreciate that. You take good notes. But one of the themes that you struck was really um, hit home to me because you talk about transforming IT from essentially a cost center into a value producer um, and how ServiceNow is at the heart of that and, and how the role of the CIO is changing. So I wonder if you could sort of summarize and talk a little bit about how you see the role of IT and generally in the CIO specifically changing and what role ServiceNow plays in that transformation. Yeah, just, just to give a little bit of macro context, right? The sort of the, the worst of all scenarios that we see out there where IT is essentially viewed as, uh, as a commodity, as a utility. Um, and as a result, you know, people don't see much impact. They just want to get it cheaper, 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 and they want to cut more cost um, you know, out of the infrastructure and the staffing levels uh, and so on. And IT is just that organization that we're tolerating because I guess we have to have email and internet access and, and all that sort of thing. Now, you go look in the, in the, in the broader uh, world around what technology has done to change business, right? What, what Amazon has done based on their technology platform, what we've seen in online banking, you know, what we've seen in online uh, education. There's just, just incredible examples of innovation using technologies. Now, IT hasn't done that for their own enterprise. They have in, in some instances. There's some, some really great examples out there where IT did impact the business, but by and large, IT is not viewed as the go-to people that know how to bring technology into business you know, in a way that, that, uh, that really turns the tables on the competition, do some mind-blowing things. I always ask CIOs when I, when I meet them, I say, what have you done in the last 12 months that really blew people's minds or in terms of applying technology to business problems, right? And they start sort of thinking like, oh, actually, it's really nothing I can think of. Well, that's probably you know, a question you should be asking yourself all the time, right? If it's not li lightning in a bottle, when it's not the sort of thing that sort of lights up the whole enterprise, like we want to do this, we have to do this, that excitement, um, then you're, you're shooting too low. And you know, in general, I find the, the cost obsession in IT is an indication uh, that we're not looking for the opportunity. And I think that's, uh, that, that's, a, that's a damn shame, and we're, we're here to change that. Well, you talked about panning for gold. It was apropos you know, here in California. Um, and it's also apropos, I mean, your, your company is smoking hot, and you know, you're, you're commonly you know, associated with the likes of, of Workday and Salesforce and Splunk. You must be very, very proud of that. But also, there's gold and then our IT shops, right? There's gold in those organizations uh, that's not being, being mined. And, and you know, I think you talk about your penetration is, what, 20% of your, of your target, your global 2,000? Yeah, we have footprint in about 18% of the enterprises that we think are relevant and appropriate to us. But within those 18%, you know, we were probably a third saturated. So still very early innings for service now, even though we've achieved considerable scale and very high growth at that scale. So when you go into one of your accounts, can you discern um, actual, that actual value production vision that you set forth? Can you see it? Can you touch it? Can you, you know, to, the, to a skeptic, uh, a prospect, say, yeah, yeah, but Frank, that sounds good, but yeah. is it really? Can you actually sort of provide proof points? Yeah. Managing surface uh, is just essential in terms of economizing and saving money. And here's why, and I'll, I'll give you some, some very uh, pedestrian examples that we've seen uh, in real life in the human resources department. And probably a good example because IT, everybody sort of understands how to how the game works, right? HR organizations historically have not had service models. They've had email and phones and so on, and you had a problem, you just, you just called somebody. You know, as a result, there was a huge amount of work uh, that preoccupied the HR organization, but nobody knew what people were working on. And the staffing grew and grew and grew to deal with the growing you know, volume of inquiries and problems and changes uh, and so on, until they had 
systems, service models, and they had reporting and analytics that showed them what was consuming their time. Once you know that, you can put initiatives in place to start dealing with the underlying causes that, that are driving that work. I have seen HR organizations dwindle their staffing by 50% just by understanding what it is they were working on, right? That's what service management is all about. Instead of just delivering service, you're managing it, right? And once that, that quarter drops, by the way, IT organizations, they get this in spades, right? Because, you know, large enterprises, they got 50, 100,000, 150,000 incidents flowing to their organization a month. It's a huge consumer of resource, right? If you go to these other service domains and, and you see very similar things, this layer of software really optimizes that resource. Well, the way they attack it oftentimes is, is, is human resource. Doesn't that scare a lot of prospects away when they, <laughs> they hear, oh wow, <clears throat> here comes service now and they're going to replace all these, these people? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. I actually wrote a blog post about it uh, recently as well. There is no doubt that in the economy at large we're going to see massive substitution from people to systems. Why? Because the technology is here and the economic imperative is here. It's very much a societal and social question. But you know, here's the thing, what's the alternative? You know, are we going to try and stop it and, and not do it? It's going to happen. The markets are going to run their course. What needs to happen is that we adjust. You know, for example, in, you know, in education, we have a lot of teachers, right? What's going to happen to teachers when education is delivered through online streaming? Well, teachers probably will have to become curriculum developers. Uh, in other words, evolve and change in their roles because education is going online. Slowly, but it's going to. Why? Because the format, the service experience is that much better, it scales that much better, and it's that much more economical than what we currently have. Well, you said today in your keynote that the, the system's broken. You know, having to put four kids through school, I appreciate the, <laughs> the little <laughs> nudge there to the educational system. Frank, <laughs> why did it take so long? I mean, these are the IT guys, these are the technology guys in the organization, they're there to deliver value. Why did it take so long for this kind of transformational yeah, you know, Steve, Steve Jobs has been, uh, the late Steve Jobs has been quoted many times as saying people don't know what they want until I show it to them. <laughs> um, and that's sort of what we're doing. We're showing it to them. That's what we did this morning. We're showing people what they can aspire to. And that's what we're here for. We're trying to stimulate, uh, inspire, motivate, give people a sense of mission, right? As opposed to keeping the lights on, managing crises, running around with your hair on fire. That's not a very attractive, you know, a view uh, to have of your organization and what you do all day, right? Yeah. So, you know, I was struck again by your keynote, the Affordable Care Act, affectionately known as Obamacare. <laughs> are they not, a, is the government not a customer of yours, or what's the scoop? Oh, could, no, could, they are. Could, they could, are. could you have helped with that problem? Uh, <laughs> we could have, yeah. for, uh, for sure, but then, right? again, I mean, then again, many people could have. Yeah, sure. Uh, no, could, that, that for, the, for the people that in, in software and technology, they look at something like that, yeah. Um, I, last night I sat at dinner with uh, the head of infrastructure for Kaiser Permanentium. They, had, they certainly know the problems of open enrollment at, at a massive scale. And it certainly, uh, we didn't want to trivialize the problem. It is really, really hard to, to operate a service like that at the scale that, that they need to. But there is no doubt that, you know, we don't need any new core technology to build systems like that. I mean, the technology exists, the skills exist. Uh, obviously, that, that should have happened a hell of a lot better than it did. So. <laughs> We're talking about your business a little bit. This is your third year now, um, right, uh, since you've joined ServiceNow? It was exactly three years this week. Yeah. yeah, so let's sort of break that down a bit. When you, when you joined ServiceNow, the, the discussion was around, and you talked about this yesterday, the, the, the whole TAM, and everybody was looking at help desk saying, wow, how can these, these, these values be justified? And then, of course, you blew that away, and now people are beginning to understand that. It's interesting to note that Data Domain, uh, you sold the company, I think, for what, 2.5 billion? The, yeah. the entire market is, is now greater than the market that it replaced. Interesting. That's right. The, the market was 3 billion. It's now, according to IDC, bigger than 3 billion and growing. Yeah. You know, so that's kind of interesting. Now that's a much more confined market. You know, you talked about the ta to the TAM there being finite. You always knew it was finite. Here it's different. Uh, you guys have started to sort of fine tune your TAM analysis and communicate that. It's, it's still hard because you just don't know the, how people are going to use your software. Um, they're finding new ways, but the TAM, I, mean, I took a stab at it, I came up with 30 billion, but it was a top down, it wasn't a bottom up, and it was, I had to get the blog post out, so it was kind of a back of the napkin, but still, it's, it's very, very large, clearly a multiple of the IT service management market. So, I wonder if you could talk about sort of the, the evolution of your thinking in terms of the market opportunity 
with uh, service now. Were you always sort of where we are today, or did that have to evolve over time? No, it, it has evolved, uh, I'd say, dramatically. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the expansion from what used to be called help desk management to IT service management has basically you know, exploded the market at least fivefold. I mean, we're licensing five to 10 times as many people on our system now for ITSM purposes than we used to in, in the mid 90s uh, during the help desk era. Because back then, all we did was license people that were physically on the help desk, right? People that would take phone calls and, and emails and so on. Now, really, everybody in the IT organization is an actor and a participant in the workflow of service management. You may be a DBA, maybe a network engineer, you're gonna get, when an incident comes in or a problem is defined, you're gonna be part of that workflow, right? So that, that expansion was not understood um, early on, but beyond that, um, service is, every, is everywhere and service is everything, right? And every physical uh, and, as a, and even non-physical assets have service models around them. So once you start looking for it, you see it absolutely everywhere. You know, I don't know what's a few billion among friends, you know, I don't know what the numbers are, but this is heavily transformational. I think one of the things that, that people struggle with, they're looking for a line of sight, right? In other words, you know, a company like Workday uh, is, is viewed very positively. Why? Because they're seeing them take dollar for dollar market evaluation away from companies that they can identify, you know, SAP and Oracle and so on. So it feels very credible to them, like, well, oh, that's $250 billion of market cap. I can see those guys from work there. Oracle, a, SAP, yeah, yeah, okay. Take a chunk out of their hide. You know, you go look at service now, you need to have more imagination. There was this great quote from uh, Arthur Schopenhauer that I showed yesterday, which said, you know, that, you know, it takes talents to hit a target that nobody else can hit, but it takes genius to hit a target that nobody else can see, right? It's transformational, right? Uh, what Workday does is modernization. What, what ServiceNow does is transformation. It's fundamentally different. So when you came on to ServiceNow, I, I presume your focus was putting in the infrastructure and the processes to make sure that you could scale. Just having watched you in your career, you're, you're big on growth, and you know, <laughs> you, you're pretty aggressive. So, so take us through sort of you know, where you sort of started and, and what the emphasis was and, and where it is now. I mean, clearly you're investing in sales and marketing, you're investing in, in AP. I didn't know this, the, the substantial number of Global 2000 companies in Asia Pacific, so that's another. So how is that, I mean, break that down into maybe one or, or, or two or three sort of segments of your attention and, and, and yeah. your effort there. There's sort of, you can sort of split it up in, in, in two major stages or phases. The first phase, uh, you know, when, when I, took over the helm of the company, was very much focused on operationalizing, stabilizing, scale, being able to deliver what we were already doing in a, in a consistent and predictable manner. And that was not a minor task because the company had grown so fast that it hadn't been able to uh, basically catch itself in terms of building the business, building the organization underneath its business. So that preoccupied us tremendously. And the whole thing about cloud is, it's not like there's a lot of people you know, running around out there that actually know cloud, that understand cloud, that can build clouds. I mean, how many people do you know that have actually done this? Because there's, you know, three years ago, I mean, there were far and few. We actually recruited people that had built the original cloud of eBay because those guys were pioneers. They had solved a lot of the problems associated uh, with cloud early on. Um, we saw a lot of people that understood data centers, but cloud is, is almost inverse to data centers, the mentality that you need to, uh, to build and, uh, and to run them. That was phase one for us. And we sort of got through that you know, about you know, a year and a half ago, for sure, about a year ago. And we started to shift gears you know, really from the operational infrastructure concentration that we've had to really starting to drive strategically the business towards enterprise service management and really expanding the addressable market way beyond where we had been before. We were going to market and telling CIOs, look, ITSM replacement, you have to do it. You're sitting on 10, 15, 20 year old software, it's crappy, it's gotta go, fine, we're gonna do that, right? But we wanna give you this much bigger perspective of managing service in the enterprise and you know, make that a mission that you can own as a CAO and drive throughout the organization you know, over a period of years. And a lot of our customers have roadmaps that are 24, 36 months, and that shows you all the things they're going to knock off over that period of time and all the different you know, parts of the enterprise. It's facilities, it's engineering, it's marketing, sales, and so on. Yeah, so okay, so TAM expansion and now obviously accessing that TAM, you know, hiring a lot of salespeople and yep. go to market. I was struck walking around the exhibit hall last night, because you just announced App Creator, I think last year yep. at Knowledge. 
I was struck by you know that the booth down there with the number of apps. I mean, it's just astounding um, where, where that's going. <laughs> I wouldn't have predicted you know some of them that I that I that I saw. So that's obviously part of the. The, the, the TAM expansion as well. I wonder if you could talk about the importance of a single system of record in order to achieve that vision, because it's not always easy, right? Politically, people want to keep data in their own little silos. So how does that work? Do you, can you, you can't force it in. Does it sort of just happen organically? How critical is that um, to your success? Now, when, when you have applications or services that relate to each other, like for example, you know, this morning we showed in the demo, I think we showed like seven or eight different applications in the course of, of one demonstration. The reason that a, a single system of record matters so much when you do that is all these apps need to be aware of each other, right? When you're, when you're staffing a project, you need to look at resource management. Well, that resource management relates to the skill requirements as well as the skills that are available, right? What you don't want is these apps living in their own universes with their own data models, their own databases, because now you have to start to hack integrations between them to make any sense out of that. And that's the world we've lived in. That's been the bane of software existence for, for so long. The service now said, we're not gonna do that, okay? Every application that relates to any other application, they're gonna be operating on exactly the same data model. And um, by the way, you see that throughout our platform, right? When you bring up um, an asset in the, in the CMDB, like a server or a router or a SAN or whatever it is, you'll be able to see all the other data artifacts throughout the platform, like incidents, and problems, and changes, and projects, and tasks that relate to that particular asset. And there's nobody else that can do that, right? And we, we provide that full 360 degree visibility. That makes app, application development so compelling because you know, all the users are already defined in the system. You don't even have to get started with that. You only define users once, right? And you reuse all that. And all the other artifacts already exist, so you get this data gravitas, that the more data that is there, the richer the application development environment uh, becomes. Yeah, we talked about this too at the analyst meeting about uh, uh, the, the relationship to your M&A strategy. You've got to be selective. It's got to fit in to that single system of record. Does that, however, limit your choices? Um, it, it will absolutely limit our, uh, our choices, but you know, this is the commitment uh, from, an, uh, from an architecture standpoint that we make is that we're not going to repeat what the legacy vendors have done is having you know, 50 apps all stand alone having to hack integrations between them. As I said, that's the world that our customers want to leave behind because it was just horrible uh, from, a, from an efficiency standpoint. After a while, all your people do is managing the operability of the patchwork plethora of assets that they have. They're not doing anything productive. And in our world, they, don't, they do none of that. Right? They're not upgrading software because it's the cloud, you know, we do that, and they're not hacking integrations between apps because there is no constant of integration on ServiceNow because all the apps are, are aware of each other through a, a shared data model. So is there still plenty of M&A opportunity for you out there though? I mean, your stock's off, I know it's off a little bit lately, which I think is really healthy, I'm, I'm happy about that. Nice little breather, uh, but still, you know, you've made great progress, adding value, you can obviously use your stock as acquisition currency. Are there still plenty of opportunities for you? Yeah, there's, there's absolutely uh, tons of opportunities. You know, at the end of the day, you know, software infrastructure is, is, is very similar and very common between applications. So for us to bring an application into our user interface framework, I mean, they have to have a user interface framework of, of some sort, right? So whether we replace what they have with ours, uh, whether we replace the data structure, we replace the underlying cloud, uh, we can do all those things, right? The question is, you know, is it going to be hard? Is it going to be expensive? Is it going to be time consuming? Or maybe not as much. And that will influence how attractive we are to the asset. All right, Frank, we're way over on time, but uh, I could go uh, forever. I mean, really appreciate you coming on. Good and to see thanks you. for having yes. us here. It's really thanks, fantastic Frank. event. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We're back with our next guest. This is theCUBE. We're live from Moscone. Be right back. <laughs>